and we're back. Welcome back, and happy Thursday. Today, we'll continue on with our discussion about threads and see examples of threading at the C programming interface, namely pthreads, POSIX threads, and the Java interface, uh, Java threads. Before we do so, let's look at some administrative bits. Uh, the reading by the 22nd of this month, October 22nd, uh, OS Concepts, Section 4.0 to 4.6, that's pages 159 to 180, and Section 4.6, which is pages 188 to 196. A week from today, I will release a written exam number one. Uh, that will be a week from today. Okay, so when we last left off, we talked about different thread models, and lastly, we talked about the most complex thread model, namely many-to-many. -many. And in that many-to-many -many thread model, we had M, many kernel threads, and these were associated with N, many user-level threads. And so in this, you can bound the number of threads that you have for all of the applications instead of doing a one-to-one -one thread mapping between user-level threads and kernel threads because you're more likely to very quickly run out of kernel threads and there are a finite number available on your operating system. So let's take a look at the thread libraries themselves. The thread library is an API that provides uh, you as the programmer with the facilities for creating and managing threads, these execution contexts that we talked about. And there are two primary ways of doing this. Uh, one is a library entirely maintaining them in user level space, and the other is a kernel level library supported uh, by the operating system. So one very popular library from the portable operating system interface, or POSIX, which is supported on Unixes like Mac OS and Linux, uh, this can be provided, this pthreads package, as either user level or kernel level. And there's a standard for that that talks about uh, creation and synchronization, uh, and it's a specification for their behavior, but not how you implement them. And so this is very common, as I said before, uh, in Unix operating systems, very popular, including Mac OS, which is uh, BSD Unix underneath the covers. And so this is an example of the pthreads library. We said it's an execution context, and so we're going to include the requisite system header in, uh, declarations, includes, and this is a preprocessor directive, so it pulls in the text uh, of pthread.h and standard io.h, so you now have definitions for the system calls for threading and for standard io. So we create a global variable, int sum, and this is global. So that's going to be in the data section of your program, right? This global is in contrast to dynamically allocated, which also exists in the data section of your process. And then we have a function declaration. Now, this function declaration, you notice, it has a return type, the name of the function, it has a parameter list, and it ends in a semicolon. So this declaration tells all of your program, this is the signature of this particular function, and it allows you to use the symbol before it is defined. And so in C, you have to define it or declare it before you can use it. But what happens if the definition for what the details of that runner function does comes after the place where it's used? Well, how you handle that is with a uh, so-called function declaration, or sometimes it's called a function function prototype. And this just tells your program, this is the name of the function, this is the return type, in this case void star, and this is the parameter void star. Now, this is going to be, this runner function is going to be the entry point for our thread. We said a thread represents an execution context, all the state information needed uh, to run or execute a sequence of instructions, a so-called instruction stream as we've been calling it. Well, it's this entry point that we're going to use as the starting place for that particular thread that we're going to create, and we'll see that down below uh, in a few lines. Now, it just so happens when you have a function that's going to be the entry point or starting place for a thread execution context when it's created, that function has to have a specific prototype, a specific signature. It's going to return a void star because it can return anything. It's going to do so as a pointer, using pointers. It's going to have a function name. It doesn't have to be runner. It can be whatever you want. 
And then it's going to take a single parameter. That single parameter is going to be void star. Now, of course, if you want to have more than one parameter type, what you're going to do is have a pointer to a struct, a C structure. A struct is a collection of types that's user-defined. And so this allows us to return a single type or return a pointer to a structure with multiple parameters or return a pointer to a struct that has multiple parameters. So we can handle both the single return type and multiple return type case, as well as the single parameter and the multiple parameter case. Now here we define our main entry point. This is our main function, int main, and main takes two arguments, argc, which is the count of the number of arguments on the command line, and then an array of char stars, so an array of strings. And these are the arguments arguments to your function on the command line. And we'll show a demonstration of that uh, when we get to the Ubuntu environment to actually try this out. So you have the argument count, argc, and the argument strings themselves. And these strings are specified on the command line, and they can be read in programmatically and used to guide uh, the, the behavior of your program. And so we have two local variables inside of main, and as we said, these are automatic storage, auto storage, and they're stored on your stack. And this is set up for you by your compiler. And these are two different types. They're both structs or C structures. One's called pthread underscore T. That's going to be the thread identifier. So we have a thread identifier variable called TID for thread ID, and it's of type pthread underscore T. It's going to be a C struct. And then we're also going to have the thread attributes that tell all sorts of information about the status of this particular thread. And that's going to be a variable called adder for attributes, and it's going to be of type pthread underscore adder underscore T. Now, of course, these C structs, pthread underscore T and pthread adder T, those are both defined in pthread.h. You could actually go into that header file and take a look at what pthread t and pthread adder t uh, are comprised of. And so you create local variables, and they're allocated on the stack through automatic storage set up by your compiler. And so now here, what we're going to do is we're going to process, process the command line, command line. So we have our argument count, and if you specify your program, let's say we called the program thread, and you said thread to run it on the command line, and you gave it uh, an argument uh, name, um, like say uh, with a number five, right? Uh, and if you did that, well, what's going to happen? It's going to give you, when you run the main, a count for the arguments, and it's going to give you the strings for those arguments. So it just so happens if we have two arguments, those indices into the arg v array are going to be zero and one. And so if we print out arg v zero in that array of, uh, of strings for the argument strings, it's gonna print out the name of the program, arg v one, that's going to be the string for the next item on the command line. So if we ran this instead of with one item on the command line, we said five and then hello, we would have another position. This is position zero, position one, position two in the argument array, and then arg v argument array position two, it's zero space, is going to have the text hello. And so this allows us to specify arguments on the command line programmatically and do something in your main program as a result of options specified to the program. And this is a C-ism for the command line. So here we're going to process the command line, and we check the argument count. We want to make sure argument count is 2 for this program to proceed. Why? Because you need the name of the program. Here's the name. And you need a number following. Okay. So this is the enforcement that the number of arguments must equal two. The name of the program followed by a number. And so now we take that number part of the argument, position one, and we check and make sure it's the right type of integer. It has to be a non-negative or positive integer. So ATOI, ATOI if you want to pronounce it, ASCII to int. It's going to take this ASCII character, convert it to an integer. 
And if the integer is less than zero, meaning it's negative, then you're going to print out an error and return. So this particular block, this if if block, that's a type of barrier, if you will. Your execution will not proceed past these two if blocks if these two conditions aren't satisfied. One condition is the number of arguments is two, and the other is that second argument in position one has to be a non-negative integer. All right, so let's look at the remainder. Now we're gonna call the system calls for creating the attributes and creating the thread itself. So the first thing we do is we're gonna get the default attributes. So we're gonna do p thread adder init initialize our attributes. And we're gonna specify the address of an attribute, a pthread adder a t structure. So before, up above, we had pthread adder t, it was called adder, and so the address of, using ampersand address notation, adder, is gonna return back the address of that particular local variable allocated on the stack. And so if we do that, we're essentially defining a pointer, the address of a place where this pthread adder init system call can store the initialized P thread uh, at attributes. So we do that and we've got these default or initialize these default attributes. And now we go ahead and create the thread. So what do we do when we create the thread? Well, we need some place to put the thread ID. And that has to be a pointer to a P thread underscore T structure, which we allocated uh, through automatic storage as a local variable. So we give it the address of T ID. Okay. Then we need the attributes. We give it the address of adder because we need a pointer to the thread attributes or an instance of a p uh, thread uh, adder underscore t a structure. And then we give it the so-called function pointer. And this is really important, function pointer. And it's the name of a function. That's what a function pointer is. But that function has to have a specific format to it. It has to return a void. So it has to be void star as the return type. The name is runner in this case. And it has to take a single parameter of type void star, right? Parameter. And that is the specific prototype for any function that you're going to use as a starting place for a threat. And then the last thing it's going to do is you have to give it a pointer to the argument that it's going to call your function with. So this void parameter for your thread starting point, your thread entry point, started by this execution context, that's going to be passed, in this particular case, the first position of argv, which is of type char star. Now, void star is C's way of saying a pointer to anything. But the particular pointer that is passing you, the, one of the anything choices, is going to be this pointer to char. And so this is how you physically get an argument to a function that is associated with an execution context. And so the instruction stream uh, in particular, that we execute with this particular thread is going to be the set of instructions for this runner function. That's going to be our execution context entry point. So now once we do this, at this point, a new thread is created and associated three different pieces of information. We said the register file, we had the stack pointer, and we had a program counter. So the program counter is going to be associated with the pointer to this location in memory for these instructions starting at symbol runner. The stack pointer is going to be used to push the parameters. The parameters here for the return type as well as the local variables. And then the register files for the intermediate values. So any intermediate value of a sum or what have you is going to go in the register file for this particular execution context. So when pthread create system call returns, well, a new thread is created, but the original thread for that single threaded process up to this point, it's going to continue running. So at this juncture, we're going to have the parent thread. It's continuing to run in this program. And then you're going to have the child thread that's running the execution context for this runner entry point. So then what does the parent thread do? Well, it calls pthread join. And pthread join's job is to tell the parent, don't continue running the block until that child thread exits. So now the parent thread is waiting for the child thread to complete. And so what do you give it? You give it the thread ID, which child to wait on, 
and then you give it this null because it's not going to take the return type. If you had an actual pointer here for the second parameter of pthread join, you are telling as a parent, wait for this particular thread identified by thread ID, TID, to, to, to exit, and then give back to me, the parent, what its exit status was. And so it calls that thread, invokes it, that thread, child thread, runs, and it's going to take its parameter, convert to an integer, call it the upper, and then it's going to sum all the integers from one to that upper uh, boundary for the integer specified as the parameter. So we sit in a tight loop. We go one, two, three, up to, an, uh, to upper, and we're going to do a cumulative sum, adding to the global variable that we had from before in the data section, uh, whatever that total sum is, one term at a time. And then the child thread calls pthread exit, gets the exit status, completion status, in this particular case, zero. Zero is the standard for no errors uh, in any sort of process or thread that exits. Now, of course, in the parent thread, when we do the pthread join, we're not waiting or we're not using uh, the exit status. But if we had an actual pointer to an integer here, we would be capturing in the parent what the exit status is for the child thread. And the parent could then say, okay, I'm going to continue doing one thing because my child thread that I spawned uh, has exited or has come to completion successfully. Okay, so this is our runner and this is our pthread. Uh, and one of the things you can do with pthread is join more than one thread. You can have more than one child thread. You could call pthread create 10 times, uh, sit in a loop, and then wait for the completion status for each one of these 10. But we're not going to do this. Uh, we're going to just show this code. So we have some number of threads. So we're going to create P thread T. So that's the thread ID. These are the worker threads, the worker array. And now we're going to join, after creating them, we're going to join each one of those threads based on its thread ID from this worker array. So a parent can create more than one child thread, and it can wait for each of those child threads uh, to gracefully exit and get its completion status for each one. Okay, so let's switch to Ubuntu, and we're actually going to look at this uh, uh, in C code at the command line. Okay, so we're in Ubuntu. Let's log in. And we're at the command line. So we have a shell uh, up or terminal. And I've already taken the liberty of creating the make file. And I'm going to bring up the make file just for uh, instructive reasons. And one of the things you'll notice, uh, I call my program thread. That's the executable. I added some rules. A target for thread.o depends on thread.c. What do I do? I run the compiler to compile thread.c to produce the object file. Likewise, the other target is thread, and the dependency for that is thread.o. I run the linker, gcc.o, generate thread, my executable, pasting in thread.o, and now the library I'm going to also statically paste or link in is going to be libpthread, and I specify that as dash l followed by pthread. Uh, implicit in the name is the word lib. So if I say dash LP thread, that's the same as going off and finding libp thread, the threading library implementation for POSIX threads, uh, and paste that in also with my object file. Uh, so that's the linking process. So I've gone ahead and I've pre-written what this thread.c uh, program looks like, uh, thread.c. And you'll notice here, it's exactly uh, what we had discussed uh, in the PowerPoint slides. And so I start out here, uh, and I have my includes, uh, pthread.h uh, pulls in the system library, system call definitions for threading, and standard I.O. for printing, and then I use string.h and stidlib standard li uh, library uh, for other uh, constants and things that I need. So I have my global variable uh, sum, and that global variable is in the data section of my process. I have my function prototype uh, for the entry point uh, for the thread. I have my main program, int argc, my arg count, char star argv. It's an array of char, char stars, or an, it's an array of character strengths. I have my local variables for my thread ID, and again, the attributes. And so here, these are the two if statements, these blocks. The first block checks that the number of arguments is two. Uh, 
and then the second block uh, checks to make sure that that argument on the command line after the name of the program uh, is an integer that's non-negative, it's positive. Okay, and so I do that, and at this juncture, uh, I then go ahead and initialize my attributes. I call pthread adder init. And so just for good measure, I'm going to print out uh, what that first argument is, argv1. I could also print out what that zeroth argument is, just to show you uh, what argv0 and argv1 is in this case, to verify what I was speaking about earlier in the PowerPoint uh, about how the argument list works uh, at the C command line interface. And so I print out these arguments, and it's my style that when I do a printf, I prefix the string with the name of the routine in which that print is occurring. It makes it a little bit easier to follow uh, when it's running. So then after that, I do the pthread create. I give it a pointer uh, to a thread ID structure, uh, pthread underscore t. So I give the address of pid, and then I give the address of adder, which is of type pthread adder t. They're both structures. And then I give it the function pointer runner, and that has to be a void return type and a single void parameter, which it is. And then I give it a char star as the payload parameter to that runner entry point for the new thread context I'll be creating. And that's argv1, which is going to be that non-negative integer. So then the parent thread does a pthread join with that created thread, a child thread's thread ID. So it's going to wait for that thread to exit. And then I print out the result of what that thread had done. The thread is going to add to that global variable that I call sum. So now we go to the instruction stream, and there's runner, has a void return type, a single void parameter, just like the function prototype. The function prototype has to match the actual function. Uh, it sets a loop index. It grabs the parameter, converts it to integer as the upper bound in the sum of integers. It sets sum to zero. And then I do a printout just for good measure. And you'll notice here I prefix the string by the name of the entry point runner. And then I go in a loop up to and including upper, and I iterate and I accumulate the sum. So if upper is five, I add one to two to three to four to five, and then the thread exits with a status of zero, meaning that it terminated normally. So let's write and quit, and let me run make. And now I have my executable, let me run thread, and I'm gonna run it with no arguments on the command line. And so that means there's only one argument, and of course, that first if block fails, and I print out, hey, you're supposed to run the program and give it an integer value. That's exactly what this printout says uh, inside of the program, that first tag. So let me run it with uh, three parameters, um, two parameters, I mean. Uh, I'm going to say five. So if I say five, all right, well, let me run it. I have two parameters. Okay, argv0 is thread. Okay, that's the name of the program. Argv1 is five, right? And so upper runner is five, that's what's passed in, and then it sums one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So let's see, one plus two is three, um, three, uh, one plus two is three, three plus three is uh, six, six plus four is 10, and then 10 plus five is five, that makes, uh, is 15, that makes 15, and it is correct. Okay, so that's my demonstration of uh, the pthread library uh, in C. It's fairly straightforward, but you have to make sure that you're using these system calls correctly and instantiating the correct structure. Okay, so with that, let me exit uh, the Ubuntu console. All right, so we're back in PowerPoint. Uh, let's continue on and let's pivot uh, to multi-threading in Java. So in Java, the threads are managed by the Java Virtual Machine. And this is typically uh, implemented using the thread model underlying uh, by the underlying operating system. Since Java, if you're using a virtual machine that runs on top of the OS, you have to use the facilities in the underlying operating system. And so Java threads are created by one of two approaches. One is extending Java Lang thread class, and the other is by implementing the so-called runnable interface. Now, with a runnable interface, you have to define uh, a run method, and that's going to be the entry point that actually gets run, right? So in pthreads in C, you can define your own entry point name, but it has to have a certain signature, 
In the case of Java, you have to implement this runnable interface or extend thread, which means you have to provide some implementation, concrete implementation uh, of a run method. Okay. And so run takes a void argument, void return type, and it takes no arguments, but certainly if you instantiate a class that implements runnable, you can pass whatever parameters you want and use that in your run method implementation. And so let's take a look at an example of implementing the runnable interface. So here we have a class sum, and sum is going to be used to store the results of adding, i.e. a sum. And so the sum is just the container class, and the whole purpose of this container class is just to hold the value for us. So we have an instance variable, sum, and again, uh, variables in Java are initialized, so we don't have to worry about initialized in Java like we do in C. It has an accessor method to get data, a getter, uh, and it's called get sum. It returns back to sum. We also have a mutator to change uh, the attribute, uh, sum, uh, a setter. So this is an accessor, accessor method, and this is a mutator, mutator method, a getter and a setter. And so the mutator sets sum, it takes an integer, and it updates that sum instance variable inside of that class. And so now here we have summation. That's going to perform the actual physical addition. It implements runnable. It has some variables, one of which is the upper bound of that sum. So that's going to define all the terms, all the integers that get summed in a sequence of integers. And then we're going to have an instance of this sum class, uh, access through reference sum value. So we start out, we instantiate it with two things, an instance of a sum class uh, through reference, and also this integer upper. So in the run method, here's the run block, and this is going to be the entry point uh, for the instantiation of an instruction stream uh, through the thread context uh, that we're going to get for this particular uh, implementation in Java. And so in this run method, what do we do? We set uh, some temporary variable to zero, and then we sit in a loop and we add the first term, the second term, the third term to this uh, local variable sum, and then we call the mutator uh, for our, through our reference to that sum instance, uh, and then we go ahead and we set that value uh, with the result of that sequence of integers we sum together. So this is in Java, and so we have our container class to hold the value of interest. We have uh, the implementation of this runnable. Uh, that's going to be our thread definition, this run method in particular. And now we need a way to instantiate it inside of a thread. So we're going to look at a driver program to do that. And so this driver program provides the main entry point for the single threaded process. That's the main uh, that is run when the program or process loads. And so we have public static void main. And now the command line in Java, you have an array of strings, args. Now, of course, if you say args dot length in Java, that'll give you the size of this uh, array in each position is a string. And so that's a lot like saying arg c, argument count in c. And so on Java, you have these properties on your data structures, and the length is one of them uh, for arrays. And this is an array of strings. Okay, so the first thing we do is we check the length of the arguments, just like we did before. We want to make sure that the length is greater than zero. And then if it is greater than zero, here in this block, we're going to check to make sure that we actually have an integer parse int uh, that is non-negative. And so then once we're sure uh, that happens, uh, if we have uh, the right type and the right count uh, for the command line, we're going to go into this block and we're going to construct our container. So we construct our container, an instance uh, of sum, and then we're going to call parse int uh, to get the upper bound that we're going to need uh, to pass off to that runnable that we're going to instantiate uh, inside of a thread. So now we get those parameters. We have two things. We have the container accessible through some object. It's a reference to a sum instance. And then we also have the upper bound, which defines the sequence of integers, non-negative integers we're going to add together. So we go ahead and we create a new thread, and we're going to store a reference to that thread in this instance, uh, this, this reference uh, to type Java Lang thread. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to instantiate it. And the thread object, when we instantiate it, we're going to give it uh, this, uh, this runnable. And so runnable sits inside of the instantiation of the thread, and that runnable provides the, the entry point that's going to be run for the uh, thread context 
and then the thread itself provides the replicate, if you will, of all that state information that's needed to run. So then we go ahead and we say start. All right, go ahead and start. And so the execution begins for that runnable, that run method, and at the same time, the parent thread that did that thread start, created that thread, it continues running. So what does the parent do? While the child thread is running in the background, well, it goes ahead and does this join. It says, I'm going to wait for the completion status of this child thread. I want to wait for that thread to finish its job. So when it does, it goes ahead and it gets the, using the reference to that sum object, it's going to get the result that was placed there by the run implementation of this runnable that was run in the background uh, wrapped in this thread object. Okay. So this is all of uh, our Java version of a multi-threaded program. Let's go into the command line, uh, and this is going to be in Mac OS, and I'm going to show this to you uh, in the actual Java program. All right, so I will meet you on the command line uh, in Java. Okay, so we're in the command line in Java, and what we have here, uh, it's just a regular uh, terminal. Uh, I've written all of the code ahead of time. Let me remove all of the class files. I have all the code ahead of time. Here we have sum.java and sum.java, just as we said, it's a wrapper class. It has the accessor and the mutator. So we have get sum and we have set sum. Okay, it's just as we had spoken about. Uh, let's take a look at summation. And summation.java, uh, there's our class. Uh, we provide it with the upper bound. Uh, with the instance of sum, the wrapper to hold the result of summing, and these are set to our instance variables. And then we have an implementation of the run method as a void argument, and it takes void parameters. And so we have this local variable, we sit in the loop, we sum all the terms, and then we call the mutator on that uh, sum instance uh, to store the result of that sum of, or the, of, some of the sequence of non-negative integers. Okay, so now let's take a look at the driver. And just as we had said, here's our driver. So we have our main entry point here, public static void main. We have this, uh, the array of strings for the argument list. We have this block that checks to make sure we have the right number of arguments greater than zero. Uh, in this case, in Java, uh, you want to check to see if it's greater than zero, not if it's equal to two. In C, uh, the name of the program counts as one of the items on the list. In Java, that's not the case. And so here, we're also going to check to see if it's a non-negative integer that's uh, on the argument list. And then we go down here, we instantiate a sum object, we parse the integer to get that upper bound, we instantiate a new thread given our summation uh, runnable, and we give that runnable uh, reference to two things. We give it the upper, the integer, and then we also give it the reference to that sum object, that container. And then we start the thread just as we had said before. So the parent process at this point continues executing, goes to the try catch block, the try portion of it. It waits for that child's completion status, thread join, and then it prints out the result. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let me exit. And I'm going to go ahead and compile Java C dash D dot. I'm going to compile everything that's a Java file. All right, so now I compile it. I have all my class files. Now I'm going to run it. Java, set the class path to the current directory, and I'm going to run driver. All right, so if I run driver, and if I don't give it anything, guess what? The wrong number of parameters. Let me run it again with a parameter 5 on the command line. I run it and go ahead right there. The sum of the first 5 is 15, and exactly as we had in C. All right. So this is a threaded program in Java using threads. And in the Java case, you're using the class structure, but it still uses the underlying thread facilities in the operating system. In my case, I'm running Mac OS, and it's using uh, the underlying facilities for threading uh, in Mac OS. The Java Virtual Machine and Java Runtime is doing so. So with that, let's go back uh, to the PowerPoint, and I will meet you there. Okay. So we're back at the PowerPoint, and we just showed uh, the demonstration of threading in Java. Uh, let's continue on, and let's look at so-called implicit threading. Now, what we showed you was the explicit creation of threads, but implicit threading uh, represents a really important design pattern uh, that was so widely used that they decided to make it part 
of uh, the libraries available in Java. And so implicit threading is growing in popularity as the number of threads your program might use is very important. And so this helps with the creation and the management of threads and it's set up by compilers and runtime libraries instead of you, uh, the programmer, having to do this. Now, in particular, we're going to talk a little bit about thread pools. And remember, when I talked about the high-performance server, let me set my pen color, we talked about the example where you have an incoming request coming from a client. Now, if you have multiple clients, you're going to have more than one incoming request coming into your server. Here's my server. Now, of course, we had what we called the responder thread, responder, and that responder thread's job was to sit in a tight loop, get the incoming request. Now, of course, for each incoming request, we said the responder could create a thread, a handler thread, to handle that incoming request. But the problem was there was a one-to-one -one mapping between each client's request and each thread on the system. And because you have a finite number of threads on the system, you can very quickly exhaust all of the thread resources. So rather than have the responder create one-to-one -one group of threads, we're going to include a queue, a work queue, and the responder is going to put those requests, request one, request two, and so forth, request K, on that work queue. Now, of course, the client handler threads, instead of a single thread for a client handler being created for each uh, incoming request by the responder, you're going to have a set of handler threads. So let's say you had one, two, three handler threads, and these are going to be client handlers, handlers. And now you have a fixed number of client handlers, in this case three, and these handlers, they're going to sit in a tight loop in their run method, if this were Java, uh, of the runnable, and they're going to pick or take a piece of work, a request, off the queue, off the uh, head of the queue, and it's going to process it and return the result back to the client. So the client handler thread is going to take the request, process it, and send it back to the client. And so because we have three client handlers, well, you don't have to scale up and scale down uh, infinitely based on the number of client requests exhausting your resources. You can fix the size or the number or the pool of client handlers that you're going to use for this purpose. So you could say, I want three, I want 10, I want 100, I want one, I want seven, so forth. So this doesn't grow. And the only difference then is that if you have more requests than you have handlers, well, those requests that are still sitting in the queue, not currently being served by a client handler, those requests are just going to take a little bit longer uh, until some client handler gets to it on the queue. And so that gives you much more graceful degradation and performance, uh, and it's much more scalable, as well as being able to manage uh, all of your resources. And so this idea of the work queue and the set of client handlers, this is called a thread pool. And it's called a thread pool is because you have a pool or a set of handlers or workers performing some tasks that they're picking off of some queue, and that gives you immense scalability. Now, this is called implicit threading because the creation and management of these threads in the pool, i.e. the set of client handlers, that's done by the runtime and by uh, the libraries, not by you, the programmer, who wants to use it. You just add requests to it, and the client handlers do the rest. Well, of course, you have to program what those client handlers do, but you don't have to manage them or instantiate them or join them. Okay. so. Let's take a look at uh, some advantages. Uh, now, usually it's faster when you service a request uh, with an existing thread rather than creating a new thread. Absolutely, the creation of a thread is much more efficient, but still, it's even more efficient if you just use an existing thread instead of having to create and delete and create and delete threads each time you have a request. This also allows you to put a bound, an upper bound, a finite bound on the number of threads uh, i.e. the size of the pool used for the application, and therefore uh, you know the performance profile uh, of all the applications on your system. You can tune it up and down based on the underlying thread support, the number of threads that you have on the machine. So you're not going to overwhelm the machine either. 
And so you can also separate a task that you want performed from the mechanics of creating the task, and you have different strategies for running it. So you could have some tasks that are periodic, some that are bursty, you could have some that have different priorities, for example. And so Windows supports thread pools, um, Java supports thread pools. It's a very immensely useful uh, pattern. It's so useful uh, that you have now runtime support in many modern uh, server-side types of languages or systems languages. Okay. And so here are some examples uh, from Java. Uh, when you create a single thread executor, that's the one-to-one. -one. So you have uh, one thread associated uh, with a request. That's a pool of size one. And then you have a fixed thread executor. That's where you have a finite thread pool for a specific number of threads in this pool. And that's specified by size with an integer that describes the number of threads in the pool. And then you have a so-called cached thread executor. This has your queue, but it creates an unbounded thread pool. And you're reusing threads much of the time, but if you don't have a thread to service it, a new thread gets created uh, rather than have something uh, spend time on a queue for a long time. And so these are three different types of thread pools. And so here's a brief example. We're not going to do this actual one in Java. I'll just show you on the PowerPoint. Uh, you import Java Util Concurrent for all the concurrent libraries that define all these things like the threading pools uh, models, both cached and singleton and fixed. So you have your entry point, public static void main. You parse your argument list uh, to describe the number of tasks you want. You create your cache thread pool, and now each time you want to create a new task, a task is the name for a thread, you just execute a task, and the thread pool hands, handles the rest of it. Now, if you say pool shutdown, all of that joining and shutting down is handled for you. And so you say pool execute the task, and uh, that new task uh, is just added to the pool, and the threads are created uh, to perform what is described uh, by that particular task instance that you've added to it. And so let's take a look at some threading issues briefly. Um, one of the big issues uh, is the semantics of threading as it pertains to creation and deletion of new processes. So what does a fork and exec do uh, system call wise if a thread executes it? What happens with the signal handling? Signal handling is a way of flagging events that occur uh, and is communicating the occurrence of certain events to the process, processes. Um, what happens when you cancel a target thread? You say, remove that thread. Uh, what if it's deferred or if it's asynchronous? What happens there? And how do you deal with storage that is local to the thread but not seen uh, by all the other threads in the same process? And what do you do when you try to activate the schedule? You have thread schedulers uh, above and beyond process schedulers. And so the fork in exec, it can be particularly tricky. Uh, when you fork, do you duplicate only the thread that called the fork, or do you duplicate all the threads? Now, there are two different versions of forking. One is the replicate all threads, or replicate just the thread that called it. And so it depends on the operating system, and many Unixes have different versions. Now, of course, if a thread calls the exec, exec says, I'm going to load uh, a new program overriding the existing program, and that's going to work as normal. Uh, so you're going to one thread calls exec, the entire process is overwritten with the program specified as exec, and now it becomes a new process. Signal handling, signals, are used in Unix systems to talk about certain events that have occurred. One is maybe kill off the process or shut down and useful things like that. And so signal handler is a program or function that's used to process signals. It's generated by particular events and it's delivered to the process in which the thread resides. And so there are two types of signal handler functions. Uh, one is the default, and so there are default actions the OS kernel is going to take. If a sig kill uh, event comes in, the operating system is going to halt that program and exit the program. Um, one is uh, the default behavior that's determined by the kernel, and there are certain default actions the kernel takes, and the other are user-defined. And so signal handler, you can override the default and you define in your process of what you think is the best way to respond to these various system events. So if you get a SIG kill, the kill signal, well, you might want to close your files uh, and write everything in memory out to disk before your process exits. And that might be a type of user-defined signal handler that you want to execute instead of relying on just what the kernel is going to do, which is just be to kill off your process.
And so you have the default handler. You can override what the kernel would do as default behavior uh, with your user-defined uh, signal handler. And for single-threaded processes, uh, the signal is delivered to the process. Uh, but certainly, if you have multiple threads, you want to do something, respond to that signal uh, in the actual thread that sees that signal. And so where should the signal be delivered if you're multi-threaded? Do you deliver it to the thread uh, that the signal applies to? Uh, do you deliver the signal to every thread in the process? Or do you deliver the signal to some threads in the process? Or do you assign, hey, this is the designated thread that's going to do all the signal handling on behalf of the process? So there are lots of different things you can do uh, when it pertains to this signal handling. And when you cancel a thread, canceling a thread means you're going to terminate a thread before it exits naturally. And so in the case of pthread, your runner program, it exits. Or in the runnable for Java, that means the run method exits. And so the thread that you want to cancel before it's finished is called the target thread. And there are two different approaches you can take to canceling or killing off a thread before it naturally exits. One is asynchronous cancellation. This terminates the target immediately. The other is deferred cancellation. This allows the target thread to check periodically, should I be canceled, should I be canceled, should I be canceled? And you might want to do that because maybe you want that thread to clean up and do something else before uh, it uh, actually decides to agree with being canceled. And so the pthread code to create and cancel a thread looks like the following. You create your thread ID, you do a pthread create, and then you call pthread cancel, giving it the thread identifier for the target thread. Okay, so with thread cancellation, um, you can have different cancellation uh, behavior depending on the state of the thread. Now, certainly, if your mode is off and there's a mode bit uh, and it's dependent on the state, it can be disabled or enabled. And so you can have deferred or asynchronous mode. You can have your state enabled or disabled. And the type that's going to occur, you can have no type, you can have deferred action, or you can have an asynchronous. So if the thread cancellation itself is disabled, the cancellation remains pending. It won't do anything until the thread re-enables it. So this cancellation kind of is pending, right? Kind of sits there waiting in the pipeline, so to speak. The default type of cancellation is deferred cancellation. It only occurs when the thread reaches a cancellation point. And so this cancellation point is the execution of this system called pthread test cancel. So that allows your thread implementation to say, okay, I've done a bunch of actions. I'm not going to let you asynchronously cancel me, but uh, when I'm ready to be available to be canceled, I'm going to call this pthread test cancel. And the reason for that, it's a very dangerous thing to asynchronously cancel a thread without it knowing it's going to happen. And so once this pthread test cancel occurs, a cleanup handler is invoked. Now, this handler is a function that's set aside to say, this is what you do when you cancel this thread, because you might want to close files that are open. You might want to take stuff that's in memory and write it out to disk to maintain a consistent system state. No, on Linux systems, thread cancellation is handled through signals, right? So you have sig kill, sig pause, and all sorts of signals, and this cancellation is done through the signaling mechanism. Thread local storage is another issue with threading. It allows each thread to have its own copy of the data that other threads can't see. So it's almost like having the data section or a heap, but it's only private to that particular entry point for the thread itself. Now, this is useful when you don't have control over the thread creation process, like you're using a thread pool. Because if you're using a thread pool, you don't control when the threads are running, when they're stopping, and so forth. So it's really nice for each thread to have its own local storage so that you don't have to synchronize or have to worry about whether to purge or, or, or what is going to happen to your global data. Right? You don't have to worry about race conditions either. And so these thread local storage are different from local variables. Local variables are only visible during the function's lifespan, right? Uh, when you get to the entry point, and then when the function exits, local variables are gone. But thread local storage is, storage is visible across different invocations of your thread function. So this is almost like saying static in Java, right? Thread local storage is unique to each thread. And so you can kind of have this pool of memory, almost like a shared memory for a thread routine, is what this thread local storage acts like. All right, so let's take a look 
uh, at schedule activations, and these scheduler, act scheduler activations deal with how you associate kernel threads with user threads. Now, of course, in this many-to-many -many, uh, models, you need communication in order to make sure you have the right number of kernel threads allocated to your application. Now, there's a data structure that sits between the user threads and the kernel threads. This is called the lightweight process, or LWP. Now, this lightweight process acts like a kind of processor. Now, this processor, when you invoke it through something called an up call, you're saying, go ahead and lightweight process, make a scheduling decision. And so this looks like a virtual processor uh, that can schedule a user-level thread to run. And so each lightweight process is attached to a kernel thread. And this is how the kernel thread gives control to the user-level thread. So the kernel thread invokes what looks like a scheduler that schedules implemented in lightweight process, and that drives which user-level thread is going to be selected for execution. And so one of the questions is how many lightweight processes do you or can you create? So the scheduler activations provides this thing called an up call. You're calling from the kernel thread up into this lightweight process, and it's a communication mechanism from the kernel in order to invoke a scheduling decision of which user level thread is going to now execute. And this communication allows an application to maintain the correct number of kernel threads because the kernel threads can invoke the user level threads, not the other way around, because that would be a disaster in the other way around because you could easily exhaust the number of kernel threads. Okay, uh, so let's take a look very briefly at operating system examples. Uh, now, Linux refers to threads as tasks rather than threads. That's just the nomenclature they chose to use. Now, this doesn't distinguish between types of control flow, i.e., whether it's a process or a thread unit of schedulability, when you create a new task. Now, thread creation is done through a clone system call, and the clone is going to allow a child task to share the address of the parent task. So in essence on Linux, now remember I said Linux, not Unix. This is not the same on BSD Unix. On Linux, a thread is nothing more than a process that is able to share the address space of its parent. And so you have a number of flags that control this behavior. They reuse the same system call in order to get threads instead of processes. And so here, we have a bunch of flags that control the behavior uh, of what it means to clone. If you say clone FS, that means the file system information is shared between the chi child task and the parent task. If you say clone VM, that means the memory space is shared. If you say clone signal handler, the signal handlers are shared. And if you say clone files, the files are shared. And so if you have a thread, all of these flags are turned on. And so we said a few modules ago, we looked at the task structure, and this task structure has elements in it, to C struct, and it points to the process data structures. And these data structures can be of a type that are either shared or unique. If they're unique, they're separate processes. If they're shared, they're threads. And so Linux made the choice of using the same mechanism to create processes and threads, and a thread in Linux is nothing more as two processes that share the same address space or child process that shares the address space of its parent. And that's how it implements threads in Linux. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to end there. Uh, and that's all I had to say. Uh, next time, we'll pick up uh, with the next module. Until then, have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday.